Last year, I was one of the ambassadors for Dutch Design Week. Uh, Dutch Design Week asks each of the ambassadors to contribute something to the program. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Design.com. So naturally, as a journalist, what I wanted to provide was content. So we came up with this series of talks called Good Design for a Bad World. And the idea was that we're facing all these huge problems on planet Earth, climate change, the assault on democracy, population movements, pollution, terrorism, things like that. And the politicians, the NGOs, the corporations don't seem to be able to sort these problems out and in some cases don't even have an interest in sorting them out. So we thought maybe design, maybe we could ask the question whether design can solve these big problems. So that's what we did, we did a series of five talks and this year Tim invited us back and said why don't you come back and do a, a reprise of Good Design for a Bad World. So immediately we thought our theme should be the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene is what some scientists are calling a new geological era, climate change, pollution, humanity is changing the face of the earth. This could be catastrophic. We could wipe ourselves out as a species and take all of um, the natural world with us. But maybe it's possible that designers can tackle these problems as, as well. This is a great quote from Slate magazine, the earth has become a design space. Saving the planet is now a design project. And this is the image that we've chosen to symbolize this talk. Of course, it's a satellite image of Earth by night, whereby we're broadcasting to the rest of the solar system the fact that this is not a natural planet anymore. So that's what we're going to discuss today. What is the Anthropocene and how can designers influence this change to help us avoid catastrophe? So a nice, light-hearted, talk for your Saturday afternoon. We have four amazing panelists uh, with me here. Sjord Kluving, who is a geologist and physical geographer. Pirjo Heikola, who's a designer and research consultant. Shalala Esaidi, who's an artist and entrepreneur. And Rab Messina, who's a researcher and journalist. I'm going to hand over now to the first of our speakers, Sjord Kluving. Thank you. I'm a geologist by training. I'm going to tell you about the concept of the Anthropocene. We are creating much more force on the Earth's surface and atmosphere than all natural processes combined. The dashboard you see behind me is called the Great Acceleration. It illustrates the big liftoff after the Second World War. We've had masses of overpopulation growth, we have masses of uh, GDP growth, any, any pic you can take in this dashboard, and it shows you how we as a world maim this. We have a huge problem. We have what's the Anthropocene, we know when it is, now we need also solutions. Johan Rockström is a Swedish scientist and he, uh, he invented the concept of planetary boundaries. There are nine planetary boundaries. He says that three of the nine, we, are just, we just overstepped the critical boundary. Climate change, biodiversity loss and nitrogen concentration in the oceans. But we need to, uh, yeah, to bring that back into the safe operating space. Kate Rayworth is an economist as from another discipline. Kate Rayworth had the model of the donut economy. She uses the planetary boundaries of John Rockström as the ecological ceiling in which we should be, live in as a safe operating space. And she also gets the social foundation, uh, social foundation which is formed by the 19 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we need these 19 Sustainable Development Goals and these nine Planetary boundaries makes 28 leads for us to tackle the Anthropocene. We need disciplines working together. We need humanities working with scientists. We need social scientists working with religious people. We need all kinds of different collaborations between scientists to, to tackle this problem. That to bring us from the Anthropocene into the, what we call the Sustainocene. And Sustainocene is a sort of long geological time frame in which we people live in harmony with our Earth system and have sustainable solutions uh, for the society in which we're living in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Pirjo Haikola and I'm a designer and a design researcher. We started about 10 years ago with the Green Dream project at the Y Factory in Delft. And our question was really, what is the spatial implication of the way we live? And what is our impact of especially our lifestyles and we made many studies and one of them was what you see here the greenest city 
uh, which we calculated for one million people, what would it take for it to be self-reliant in terms of energy and food? And you see this really large field, basically, of, um, of wind turbines and two large areas of solar thermal power plants and four artificial hills that contain more than 100 floors of highly efficient food production. And when we made this calculation and visualization, it sort of started to, to make it very clear um, what is the impact that we need to create if we want to make any green design efforts. We made several different studies, and another one similar was uh, Footprint Manhattan, where we looked at the Manhattan Island, and what would it take for it to be self-reliant with food. And you see those towers there. The green tower is mostly for the fodder for the animals that we eat. And on the right you see what would it look like if you would distribute that food production on top of existing buildings, which is more than uh, twice the height. And we made some proposals. One was this one, which is uh, floating solar thermal power plants that would generate energy for cities. But then after these years of working on these projects, they do convey the impact that, that we have and we could have as designers as well. But was our work really creating any impact itself? So I was really wondering what is our agency as designers and what is my agency in these projects? And I changed course completely. I spent last two years working actually more with marine scientists and with oceans, which is really my passion. And at the same time, I started to study what does it really take for us designers within organizations to make environmental initiatives? How do they get further in terms of decision management? How do we need to get argumentation for our work so, so that we can facilitate this to go further? Thank you very much, Pirio. Over to you, Shalila. So hi, I'm Shalila Asaidi. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm what they call a bioartist and an uh, entrepreneur. And as a bioartist, I work on the crossover between biotech and creative industry. And for me, it started with a bulletproof human skin uh, made out of uh, synthetic spider silk from genetically modified goats. It has amazing properties. It's biodegradable. It's uh, stronger than steel. It's uh, a better heat conductor than copper. So. I thought these are man-made new materials that are stronger, but they are inspired by nature. Bulletproof skin uh, was still in research for medical applications uh, in 2016, but for this research we needed some genetically modified goats in the Netherlands, uh, because these goats come uh, from Utah. But then we have our regulation in uh, Europe, and it's very strict, so it was very difficult to get some genetically modified goats into the Netherlands. And I started to talk with some policy makers uh, and uh, farmers about getting these goats uh, to the Netherlands. But at that point, I discovered that we had a other big problem. Farms are getting bigger. We need more cows, uh, pigs to feed the population. And the problem with the manure is getting bigger. And the policy makers are making policy to try to stop this. I also took uh, a bucket of uh, cow manure with me in the lab because I research materials, that's what I like to do. And we discovered that cow manure exists of a lot of cellulose. And cellulose is nothing else than the grass and the corn the cows eat. So I decided to make textiles out of it. So in 2016, we did a fashion show and it's, uh, we won the H&M Global Change Award, and then I really got into the textile industry and learned how sad this world is, is doing, how much great materials we are wasting, and how much great materials we see as a waste. Because farmers in the Netherlands are paying like 18 euro per cube per ton to get rid of this manure. So they are being fined to get rid of a waste material, which isn't a waste material. I believe we live now with a generation that thinks differently, that moves differently, that is concerned about this world and wants to know where the materials and uh, products come from. So I started BioArt Village. It are five German bunkers from the Second World War in the middle of the forest. With a lot of companies and volunteers and young people, we transformed this village into an off-grid system where we work with solar panels, with uh, creating our own water, a sewage system which exists of plants, bacteria and fungi to clean uh, the waste streams. So in short, that's what I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm finally back. 
So as a journalist, my beat is design and economics. And I also started exploring the business side of mostly Latin American things. I'm originally from the Dominican Republic. What I see um, as the next step, specifically within the Anthropocene situation, is what I call the piñata problem. There was a party and the West filled the piñata with candy using our resources, ate up all of the candy, and now that we are finally invited into the party, late, they say, right, you have to scrape the wrappers for chocolate or come up with a way to make chocolate with the wrappers. That generates a lot of resentment. So my position right now with this research is, if to paraphrase uh, one of the tenets of the Me Too movement, if you are in a room full of sustainable designers and everyone else looks like you, be embarrassed. It's not sustainable. So it's about the desire of the South being taken into account in the Anthropocene because there are active Anthropocenists, that is, the North, and passive Anthropocenists, that is, us, the South. Right, so let's get to the crux of the matter, because it, it, it's easy to get depressed about all of this, that the idea of guilt has come up, I mean, but let's try and turn this into a positive. What, is, what can we be optimistic about, and particularly in relationship to design? Can designers help to turn the situation around? And what is our advice to young designers? What should they be doing? Maybe we should start with you, Pirio. What is, what is, what is optimistic? What can we feel good about in all this? Yeah, well, I mean, the only thing we can be is optimistic. We cannot just drop everything and stop doing things. But we, instead of completely undoing what we've done, we have to think anew, in a way, and different kinds of systems. And I found in my research that designers do have a lot of agency in the industry. And I really found that industry is also way more receptive now than it has been. This new paradigm, whether we call it transformation economy or circular economy, it's really, you can see it happening and industry is more open. So if we as designers take a more active role and do our research and really understand what we are talking about, when I'm teaching students, I try to tell them to try to find where their agency lies, because in different points of your career, you have different agency. When you're just beginning, you have different ways you can influence things, and later on, other ways. To try to really find what, at that point in time, is the agency you have, and what kind of collaborations you need to make that happen. And I think it's really, really important for design students. Yes. And, and Shalila, you were talking about the fashion industry and the, the notion of, of waste. And I guess it's kind of like a, um, a, a way of thinking about words like waste, because it's, if you, we've got used to the idea of waste is stuff you throw away, but there is no such thing as a way, is there? So specifically in the context of fashion and agriculture, how can you scale that up so that it does actually start to make a difference? Well, in my eyes, there is no waste, and nature doesn't know any waste. If we look at how much manure we are producing nowadays, in Europe alone, we are producing more than one trillion of cow manure each year. Uh, this is going to grow because uh, China is now already having farms with over 150,000 cows each. If you look at uh, the United States, you can find complete manure lagoons, and other countries are growing too. So. On the one hand, you have this material and you can put money in it to destroy them. But on the other hand, the, t the industry is seeing that they have to change. They have to look for other alternatives because the materials they are working now with are also getting scarce. And um, what I see, it's not only the designers um, looking for the industries, it's also the industries that are looking for new ideas, solutions to solve their problems because they have big problems they are dealing with. And Rob, what about a Southern Hemisphere um, perspective on this? Because you talked about how, you know, the, the coming late to the party and, and that kind of thing, but presumably the Southern Hemisphere also has lots of solutions to offer. And, and how, do, how, do the, how can we come up with a uniquely Southern Hemisphere set of solutions? That is a problem. I don't think we're there yet. And when I say we, I speak as a Latin American. The problem is that when you are focused on surviving, you cannot really think of scalable solutions. And I think that is why this collaboration is so important. We have a very acute awareness of our needs and, and the cultural mores as well. They're not being taken into account right now by designers. I'd like to, 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 to scale up the discussion a little bit because if, if we think about um, the, the way that the hu human activity is changing the earth, Let's talk about scenarios of how the Earth could look in 50 years' time or even 100 years' time. In order to sustain life on the planet, we have to 
start geoengineering, we have to start changing coastlines, we have to start almost polarizing or Netherlandsizing the, the entire planet. I mean, what, do, what, what, do, what is your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's a very important question, of course, to have your vision, in fact, of the next 40, 50 years. As humans, we should be more aware of what we're doing, and I think there's a growing awareness. Like, the awareness in the news, the awareness in the media is growing. I think also population of people are also getting more used to Anthropocene, to circular systems, to sustainability issues. So my my vision will be that this this is a transition. We're actually in an age of transition, transition to new energy systems. And my hope and my my ideal is also that we make this transition in different spheres. We are the first species on Earth who have changed the situation and are conscious of it. And that's an important realization, of course, that we are also able to change it back again. And Pirio, you showed some, some drawings of, of like a, what a future sustainable city could look like. What does the, the sustainable Anthropocene city of the future look like? In terms of food production, we have to change it a lot because we are running out of fertile soil, we are running out of nutrients, a lot of things. So Netherlands, of course, is, a, is an interesting example of that. A lot of the food is grown in greenhouses here. And that, that is one way of making it more efficient. So we obviously need to find more efficient food production methods. and. We have to get rid of petroleum and carbon-based economy. But it also means that that's, um, we also have to facilitate these young designers in doing and scaling up what they do. Because what you now see a lot is designs stay very small and they don't get the opportunity to grow and to demonstrate themselves. And I think that's a big role for our government to, to stimulate that more. Your work, for example, you showed the little the, the cottage in the forest where you've gone yeah. to live sustainable, which is, is beautiful, but it's kind of a bit Hansel and Gretel, isn't it? It's a bit like we can't. That's not a solution for everybody. We can't all go and live in a forest and put a solar panel. No, on that's the roof. that's the dream. I think of mo for the most of us, or maybe only me. I I think it's also about the old and in the new. Because what you are seeing now is also a lot of craftsmanship coming back because we want quality uh, over quantity. We want to know where our stuff comes from. One of the things is also to a rewilding issues uh, for nature, but also nature in the city. Yeah? You see more greening in the yeah. city happening. And that's one of the things where you can add biodiversity to urban culture. But isn't, isn't there an argument that you know, rewilding and what, caring about the provenance of your food and wanting it to be more crafted, it's kind of like, isn't that an es trying to mentally escape from the scale of the problems? Because if, taking the north-south co uh, conversation again, if everyone wanted sustainably caught fish, and if everyone wanted, you know, handcrafted this, that and the other, they, they would, we would very soon run out of everything, wouldn't we? It would just be impossible. Uh, you need both. I think you need the craftsman state and you need as well the, the large upscaling and the upscaling process associated with it. Uh, so it's important to, to have both nations and industry and sciences and also uh, little small circles also trying to, to work on this project. And the example of China is of course is fascinating in the sense that this, the big things are happening and you can, you can imagine yourself what, uh, what, what the scale would be. The good thing about China is that it's still ratifying the Paris Agreement, uh, which, which most of the world is doing, by the way. Yeah, I think here we have this issue that we are being a bit too slow, and that's putting it mildly. I mean, we have been talking about this for decades now, and we are still at the same stage, and actually worse. We're just going backwards in terms of emissions and everything. Yeah. So, I mean, we have to be a lot faster. Sure. And I do think that if, bringing it back to designers, it's true that we should look beyond the pilots and we should stop um, praising little projects and we should aim much bigger and we should really start to think of bigger systems where we can get involved. And give us some examples of those bigger systems. I mean, what kind of things should we be advocating for? For instance, if you work with industry and you actually engage with industry and you change a use of material or a waste stream or transform it more into a service kind of system instead of product system, it makes a massive impact because the scale is so big. And Shalila, back to the, the cow thing, I mean, surely one of the, the biggest changes we could make is like not have cows anymore. If we all switch to a vegan diet, it is argued that that would be the yeah. single biggest change that we could all make in our lives. Yeah, that's true, sure. but that's the ideal world. It's and at the moment, we are not living in the ideal world. So we have to deal with the problems we are having now. 
I'm of the opinion that we here in the West cannot uh, say other countries what, how they should live and how they should act. They should have also have the opportunity to destroy the planet and clean it up again, like we did. And again, Rab, what, from a, a southern perspective, um, what's, what's your response to that as well? I actually nod it because I agree. There's a lot of resentment. We got late to the party and now you're selling us sustainability. We did not get to pollute and enjoy the process of pollution, unfortunately. So that resentment needs to be managed. That's an interesting point. You didn't get to enjoy the process of pollution because yes. we're, we're all here and we're sort of bleeding heart liberals and we're like, oh, pollution is bad and craft yeah. is great. Yeah. But um, yeah. well, I guess the alternative is we accept we're on a, a destruction mission and just make the most of it and enjoy the ride. Pretty much, I mean, if we continue like this, few decades and we are suffering really bad consequences so either we change something or we get destroyed I mean that's really pretty much what we have I, I, let's think about really 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 big solutions if you could I mean we, it's a shame we don't have an engineer here or an architect on the panel but I've heard um, proposals for example that in order to stop sea levels rising we could build massive walls to hold back the the Greenland ice cap, for Geo example. Geoengineering. Mm. Geoengineering, exactly. Yeah. We, could in, we could squirt chemicals into the atmosphere no, that reflect like, sunlight back. There's a problem with it, eh? because geoengineering sort of says to us people, oh, just go on what you're doing, yeah? we just, we'll just solve the problem. Yeah, in fact, so geoengineering is a debatable thing. Yeah? It's, a, it's, it's being researched right now, but to, uh, yeah, we even don't know actually what's going to happen when you insert chemicals into the atmosphere yeah? to, to, to stop maybe CO2 processes. So it's, it's important to, uh, yeah, to, to make us people just conscious of the fact what we're doing and trying to maybe reduce our actions, maybe to, to stop driving cars or to stop uh, uh, flying or anything else, uh, just to, to have some sort of a ba more balanced way of, a sustainable way of living. And I think that's, that's our challenge to, to sell to the future. And do all of you agree that being sustainable is the solution rather than believing in kind of science fiction solutions to, to changing things? We probably need both. We may need some geoengineering in the future to, to manage some of the worst effects. Yeah. But at the same time, we also need to be figuring out a different way to live. And yeah. that will be a little painful. But I would say yes, please, more science fiction. Let's keep dreaming big and doing the impossible, making bulletproof humans flying into space. Why not? Yeah, because it, 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 it almost feels like sometimes there's a, a sort of failure of imagination in the design community because a lot of the solutions that have been proposed are kind of nostalgic about turning the clock back and, and putting things back to how they were. But uh, when we were thinking about this talk, it was almost trying to make the Anthropocene like an exciting mega design challenge. If you think about what people like Elon Musk are proposing, they're proposing moving to Mars and terraforming a Mars and sorting Mars out. But it's almost like, why don't we apply that kind of ambition and vision to our own planet? Because there's only going to be a few lucky people who can get on the rocket to Mars. But first you have to think about it, rocket and Mars before you can apply it here small. It's so, dreaming, so that's like maybe. a test model almost, is it, do you think? For... It's a, like a far escape, like yeah. looking somewhere there and maybe you find aspects you can take here like dreaming big and taking the elements you find and connect them in here and solving here but keep keep dreaming keep believing yeah. keep trying it's interesting that the kind of the whole aesthetic of science fiction, the aesthetic of the Jetsons and, and the future, it has gone, isn't it? Everyone, we're all wearing mm. clothes that look, could have been, you know, sorry, no offence, but in the Victorian, <laughs> <laughs> we're all wearing clothes that we're not. None of us are wearing kind of high-tech materials. We express ourselves nostalgically. Is, is, is this holding back our ability to save the planet? This this insistence that it needs to be sustainable, <clears throat> and ethical. To some extent, I think it, it might be. I mean, we cannot, we cannot do the undoing as it's been suggested. We cannot just undo what's been done and go back to something. We are a lot more people on the planet than that we were, so we obviously can't live that way. It's not going to work. So we need different ways of working. So we do need more imagination and making it happen as well. Not just to imagine, not like the 70s science fiction of, of uh, crazy projects, but we need to do them. Really, and I think geoengineering is one of them, which is happening. And in the oceans, they are trying it for coral reefs. They have all kinds of crazy proposals of trying to shield them with things, and and they have to do them. 
but also I read that um, biologists are trying to um, bioengineer coral because the problem with the coral is they can't stand the, the dramatic um, spike in temperature. So you could just bioengineer the coral to be able to cope with the. They are trying everything they can, basically everything possible approach yeah. you can imagine. They are trying. That's something really cool and. Um... I think we should change regulation in Europe and, and uh, accept that biotechnology is going to be a big part of our society and, and make more things possible. Now we are really living on, on the old standards, the old systems, and there needs to be a change. And the designers are running in the front and thinking about all these crazy ideas and concepts. But we need a, a society, a government that follows and allows things to happen. Just to, to round off, I want you to all think of one thing, one big change or one thing that we should do in order to make the Anthropocene era more of a success for humanity. Rewilding, because I think rewilding is one of the, one of the issues and if we are able to rewild more in, in Europe, so create our own national parks, create our own nature, we, we can combat also uh, biodiversity loss, we can, we can do something about climate change and we can do something about a livable area. More people are living in cities, less people are living on, on the land in Europe, so there's a big chance of uh, rewilding, of changing our landscape of the future. I'll go back to my initial comment of figuring out what is your agency in this whole thing. So what is the collaboration need? What can you do on a personal level and what can you do professionally, especially if you're a designer, to, to contribute to this most important issue that we have to deal with right now? Being less scared as a society um, because of a lack of knowledge and, and education, we are afraid of things that might happen. And I think we shouldn't be that much scared. We should. Uh, be open for those opportunities in the future. I would try to make sustainable design either aspirational or accidental for the South. That is, you can turn a lot of people into accidental environmentalists, depending on how you sell it. I think the clearest example is how IKEA turned hundreds of thousands of people into accidental environmentalists by um, changing their, the way their light bulbs worked. But in a fashion sense, I think the, one of the greatest examples is a brand called from Los Angeles called Reformation. They don't really sell themselves as a green brand or a sustainable brand. They just make really, really great dresses at affordable prices. And it so happens that they're part of a circular economy. That type of thing. Thank you all so much for being such an amazing and, and, and well-informed panel. Thank you to our audience and to Dutch Design Week for hosting us. That we have not solved any problems today, but I think at least we've, we've hopefully put, put a problem on the wall and um, forced everyone to stare at it and consider it. Thank you all very, very much.